Hey, on, on your way to your seats this morning, before you're seated, just ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, are you a Swifty? Are you a Swifty? Are you a Swifty? Are you a Swifty? If they are, just say, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Ask your other neighbor, say, are you, a, are you more of a Usher Raymond type? You know, come all the millennials are just been practicing all week, right? I know I have U-S-H-E-R. I'm ready. I got my own B-R-A-N-A-M-I-E-R-A-W-C. No, that's a whole, that's not in my notes or nothing, but all right, guys. Hey, you ready for the word this morning? It's going to be a good day in God's house, man. I, um, I missed last week. Pastor Mariah preached an incredible message, I hear, um, and she just shut the house down. Um, and she, we, we wrapped up our series, Happy, Healthy, and Holy. Come on, how many of you were blessed by that series? How many of you feel like your life has been, you know, on the up and up since that series? You've, you've got a little happier. Some of you this morning, you walked in with a sad face. I told you to put a smile on. Come on, because we're trying to be happy in the house of God. How many of you feel like your life has been getting a little bit healthier? Some conviction has come your way. You're trying to eat a little bit cleaner, work out a little bit harder. Some of you. How many of you, if you're being honest this morning, you're like, my life has been holier, Pastor Brown. I've been trying to, you know, not be so ratchet this year. I've been trying to be a little bit more holy. Come on, if, if that's you. Come on, that series was for you. Um, but what an incredible time. Today, I want to preach a message that's not, that's not a part of any series. Uh, we're going to start a brand new series next week that we'll announce a little bit later. I'm very, very excited for it. Um, but today is really just a, a standalone message, if you will. I was like, hey, it's Super Bowl weekend. It's also the Sunday before Valentine's Day. Um, how could I preach about like Jesus being our quarterback, you know, the Father being the coach, and the Holy Spirit being the running back? And they're all in lo- like, how could I? No, I was like, forget that. I'm not going to try to preach what the culture tells me to preach. I'm just going to preach what I feel like the Holy Spirit is telling me to preach. And so um, I want to preach just a standalone message that I feel like the Lord put on my heart um, this week. I had a lot of different titles because it was raining all week. Um, in the beginning of the week, you remember that? It wouldn't stop raining. And so I had some good titles, Rain, Rain, Go Away, um, <laughs> Make It Rain. I was like, Lord, I don't know if that will you know, lose people or attract more people. So I'm not going to go with that one. Um, but I, I got, if you have your Bibles, let's start there, yeah? Let's open up our Bibles this morning. Acts chapter 2, uh, I'll read a couple verses of Scripture, and then um, I'll give us a title, and I'll, I'll share with you what I feel like the Lord shared with me. Acts chapter 2, starting in the 42nd verse, I'm reading out of the, the New King James this morning. Uh, Acts chapter 2, starting in the 42nd verse, it says this, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And now all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and their goods, and they divided them among all, as anyone had need. Verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I want to preach today from this title, if you're taking notes, Keeping the Momentum. Keeping the Momentum. Let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gift that it is. Thank you that we can open up the word and pull out biblical truths. We can understand more about who you are who you've called us to be, God. So thank you for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Keeping the momentum. You know, momentum is one of those things that when you have it, you want to keep it, right? But when you don't have it, you want it back. Momentum is one of those things that's kind of like a snowball. That It starts out small, but the more it rolls downhill, it begins to pick up more steam, and over time, more things, more ice, more snow is added to it. And before you know it, it's this massive, giant snowball rolling downhill, and it's very hard to stop. Many of us today, as we watch the game later today, you'll, you'll start to see, or maybe you'll hear the announcers say, the momentum is, is shifting, or you can feel the momentum start to change. And really what it is, it's a... a in, in this t- context, it's, you know, football, it's one good play after the other, or one great tackle, or one great pass after the other. These small, little, tiny victories over time added up starts to build some confidence. 
starts to build some like, we got this, starts to build some, we can do this. It starts to build some momentum. And then before you know it, you're winning the game. Momentum. When you have it, it's great. When you're on the other end of momentum, it's terrible. Because you know, like life is kicking my butt right now. Everything that could go wrong is going wrong. It's momentum in the wrong way. You ever been there before? Like I try to make good decisions, but just it just keeps happening over time. Bad things keep happening. Or I try to do the right thing, but no matter what I do, bad things keep happening. I don't want to talk about that kind of momentum on your life today. I want to prophesy over you that positive momentum, good things, good change, good habits are coming your way. Amen. Good momentum in Jesus name. And so what we just read was Acts chapter two. This is the beginning of the church. The uh, Jesus has already gone back to be with the father. He was already crucified. But Jesus said, before you go and do anything to the apostles, before you go out and start preaching, before you go out and start building churches, before you start uh, sharing my, my life and my testimony, before you do any of that, I want you to wait for the gift of the father. And so the disciples, they all get together. This is Acts chapter two. In the very beginning, they get together. And the Bible says for about 10 days, they all begin to pray and, and fast and, and just whatever you have for us. We're, we're waiting for you, God. In, in the beginning of Acts chapter two, the Bible says that the apostles, all of a sudden, they hear a sound of a mighty wind come and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they all begin to speak in other tongues and they all begin to pray and other people in the city can hear what was going on. So they ran to this, to this upper room and they're like, what is going on with these people? They're all speaking in other tongues and they're all look like they're praising God. They look like they're kind of drunk. And the Bible says that the people are like, what's up with them? Are these guys drunk? And Peter's like, no, we're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> Read your Bible. That's what he says. They're not drunk. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is they get this, this feeling of the Holy Spirit. Now they're empowered to do the thing that God has called them to do because Jesus said, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you, but I'll always be with you through the power of my spirit. And so now they've been empowered. Now they're ready to go. And so they step out of the upper room and Peter preaches the very first gospel message. He preaches, repent and be baptized. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus loves you. We, we witness him. We know that you killed him, but God raised him back to new life. He's alive. And the people hearing this message, they, they began to get convicted. They're like, what do we got to do to be saved? And right there in that moment, Peter's like, repent and be baptized. And so they do. And 3,000 people were added to the church that day. It was amazing. 3,000 people. That's a move of God. Would you agree? That in just one message, 3,000 people were added to the church. And then the rest of the chapter goes on. But it, and it says this, at the very end of Acts chapter 2, the Lord added to the church daily. So it wasn't just like a one-time thing. It wasn't just like a good concert and some good preaching. Come on. You know how everyone gets saved at a Christian concert? It's like, bro, you're at a Christian concert. You're probably a Christian anyways, but they do the altar call and everyone's like, me, God. It wasn't just like an emotional moment that happened. And everyone was like, I want to join the church. It wasn't just a one-time thing. Like Peter didn't have the keys behind him making him sound real spiritual. It wasn't just an emotional moment that all of a sudden 3,000 people were at it. No, no, no. 3,000 people were at it on the day of Pentecost. But then as they lived their life, the Lord added to the church daily, which means they were doing something right. Would you agree? They were moving in the spirit of God. Because it's one thing to add to the church yearly. It's like, oh, we got a new family. Praise God this year. Oh, we got a new family this month. Praise God. No, no, no. Daily people were being added to the church. I would say they had some momentum moving in their ministry. And see, that move started over 2,000 years ago, and we're sitting in that same move of God right now. What started out as 12 disciples turned into 72, turned into 150, turned into 3,000. Now, here we are, 1.2 billion Christians alive today, 
It's the same move of God. There's some momentum happening in this ministry, but here's the truth. Not every church has momentum. Not every church adds to their church daily. Some are doing the opposite. Some are losing every Sunday. It's like, yeah, we ain't coming back next week, baby. You ever been in one of those? Yeah, we ain't coming back. And so I want to look at the early church. I want to look at what they were doing and say, man, how were they able to add to the church daily? Because the truth is, we've kind of been doing the same thing. We, we've kind of been on this. You know, when we started this church in July of 2021, I'll tell you just a quick story, not in my notes. Um, we started in July of 2021, which, you know, all the experts say don't plant a church in uh, the summer because people are on vacations and people don't want to go to church in summer. It's too hot. And uh, definitely don't plant a church during COVID. So I was like, yeah, we're going to plant in summer and we're going to do it in COVID. Um, just I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual rebel like that, you know? And so uh, our grand opening, it was amazing. About 200 people showed up. Now, mind you, half of them were my friends and family and they just came out of pity. And that's okay. That is okay because it felt real good, right? It's like, look at this, a move of God. So we had a grand opening service in July. The very next weekend, I tricked everyone. I was like, next weekend, we're doing baptisms. And so you get people signed up for baptisms, and then they have to invite their friends and family to come back again, you know? And so again, it was like 200 people showed up. I was like, look at God. Look at what he's doing. The next weekend, same thing. It was like 200 people again. It was amazing. And then that week, the third week of our grand opening, we got a knock on the door from the fire marshal. He's like, yeah, y'all can't be doing this. I was like, oh, you got to have like permits and stuff? Like, I didn't know like there was like sprinklers that you had to like get all right. So anyways, we got shut down <laughs> and we went online for about a month. And what was about 200 people quickly turned into an online audience. So we didn't have no views. I was like, oh, God, what's happening here? And so we started making some phone calls. We called some other churches. Thank God for Life Church. They let us, lose, yeah. they let us use their church on a Saturday night, which I know you guys are all fired up about Saturday night church, right? <laughs> Everyone just loves a Saturday night service. And so it quickly went from 200 turned in about 20. It was like my mom, Mariah's mom, you know, our kids ministry was just mine and, and the McLean's kids. It was amazing. Uh, a couple of, other, of you guys were there, but week after week, day after day, like we kept praying, we kept serving, we kept giving, we kept believing that this was going to be a move from God. And over time, we eventually got back into our building. And as soon as we opened the doors back up, that 200 quickly showed back up. And now in less than two and a half years, here we are, you know, 800 plus strong. The kids ministry is 150 every Sunday. It's just a, a real move of God happening. It's amazing. It's amazing what's happening in this church. But see, I want to continue the movement. I want to continue with the momentum because there's some things, there's some behaviors that took place in the beginning in Acts chapter two, and in order for us to continue these results that the early church had, then we must examine the behaviors that the early church displayed. Like, it's not a coincidence that good things happen. It's not a coincidence that the Chiefs get to the Super Bowl all the time. Like, it's just, it's not. As much as I hate them, like, I'm just a hater, I'll be honest, but it's not a coincidence. Like, they're doing something right. Like, the early church was doing something right. Because here's, here's what's amazing to me. They didn't have social media. They didn't have the internet. Like these dudes were walking everywhere. Like some of you are mad just to walk from that dirt parking lot into here. It's like <laughs> my shoes, you know? But these dudes were walking city to city preaching the gospel. They were doing something right and the Lord was adding to them daily. How do they keep this momentum? How do they continue to spread the gospel? How do they reach so many people? See, it's easy for us to look at the results of a move of God, right? And it's easy for us to look at the success of someone's life and then want to mimic their success. But see, you'll never get their success until you fully understand their sacrifice. Until you actually know what they've gone through and what they've went through to get that success, you'll miss it. And so you end up copying someone or trying to, trying to do something, but you don't fully understand the sacrifice and the time that went into them getting that success and so you won't get it. And then you'll look at yourself and be like, well, I'm just not good enough. I'm not smart enough. We're not capable enough. We don't have the resources. We don't. And it's like, no, no, no that's, that's the wrong way to look at it. You, you just don't fully understand the sacrifice and the time and the commitment and the prayer that went into that move of God or went into that finance, uh, the, into that good situation. You don't fully understand the sacrifice. So the question is, 
the question isn't what's wrong with you. The question then becomes, are you ready to commit to the process? Are you ready to commit to the sacrifice? Are you ready to commit to the lifestyle necessary to achieve the things that they achieved? See, initial commitment is easy. Write this down. But continued commitment takes conditioning. Initial commitment, man, it's easy. Let's try it out. Let's check it out. Let's go. Let's, let's start the gym. Come on, let's start eating healthy. It's easy to initially commit to something. But continued commitment takes conditioning. That's what I want to talk about today. How do we keep this momentum going? We have to be conditioned. You know what it was like when you first went back to the gym? Come on, you remember? You started to taste the blood in your throat. <laughs> You were dying on like the second set. You're like, I am fat and out of shape. Come on, I'm speaking to myself. Like, I did a boxing workout this week, and I was like, dear God, no. Please, Jesus. Terrible. It was not good. But see, what I've learned is that over time, done consistently, those workouts become easier and easier. It's called getting in shape, right? And so we can commit to something initially, but if we're going to be in this for the long haul, if we want God to add to the church daily, then we have to be conditioned for the thing that God wants to do in our life. And I wonder what would happen if, if we just had a church that said, you know what, I'm not just committed to the church, but I'm going to be conditioned for the church. I'm not going to stop serving. I'm not going to stop giving. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop sacrificing. I'm not going to stop even when things get hard. Why? Because I'm conditioned for it. It's easy to give up when things get hard, right? Right? It just means you're out of shape, right? It just means you're out of shape. It's not that you can't do it. You're just out of shape. So when things get hard, because it's not always glitz and glamour, it's not always like, this is a move. Like life don't always feel like that. But when life comes and smacks you in the face, are you conditioned for the thing that God wants you to do? Because if you're not in shape for your calling, then you'll be like, no, not me. God, have someone else do it. And God's like, no, I've called you. But you've got to be conditioned for the calling that God has for your life. And so what did the early church do? Because if we're going to continue to build something that lasts, that's thriving, that's healthy, I don't want you to just be committed to it. I want you to be conditioned for it. So let's look at some principles this morning of the early church. Here's some qualities that we all need to have if we're going to continue the momentum. You ready? We need spiritually mature believers, number one. Spiritual maturity is a must. Someone say amen. amen. See, if you've been here longer than a year and you're not growing spiritually, I hate to say it, but that's on you. It's on you. Like if you've been showing up to the gym for a year, right? And you're still not in shape. I hate to say it, but that's kind of on you. Like you walk around and you talk to everyone. What's up, man? Good to see you, bro. And you take your selfie and you post it and you drink your shake or you pretend to drink your shake. But after a year, if you're still not in shape, that's on you. See, church is just the spiritual gym. You come here and I can, I can show you the workout. I can give you the technique. I can tell you the diet plan, but you have to lift the weight. You have to execute. You have to, you have to do it. See, they continued steadfastly. Here's what the Bible says, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Uh-oh. That means they were like actually listening to what the disciples were saying and then actually doing it. They were like studying and reading and growing. They were committed to growing. They were committed to understanding. They were committed to learning more. Spiritual maturity is a must. See, our world is it's constantly changing. And information now is like a commodity. It's like everywhere. You can get any information that you would ever want in the click of a button. Like it's available and it's out there, Right? But see, you have to be able to decipher what's truth and what's a lie. And you can, you can follow anyone or find anyone that will agree with your opinions, agree with your thoughts, and tickle your ears and make you feel good. Right? We can all find someone who fits like 
oh yeah, I like them because they already agree with everything I say. But see, spiritual maturity is saying, what is God's opinion on a subject? Spiritual maturity is saying, what is God's truth regarding the circumstance? Spiritual maturity is saying, I- I'm so committed to God's plan for my life that even if I have to modify my behavior or my thinking, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I want the things of God for my life, even if it makes me feel uncomfortable. Even if I have to change some things in my life, we need some spiritually mature believers to keep the momentum going. So the, the early church, man, they, they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the word. And see, I'm pleading with you this morning to devote yourself to the word of God because it's not just about head knowledge. It's not just about learning more, but it's about getting the head knowledge and then actually applying it to your life. So that's how you get a transformed life. See, the early believers, they didn't just listen to the apostles. They actually lived out the things that they were learning. They, they let it shape their decisions. Are you letting the word of God shape your decisions? Are you letting the word of God shape your attitude? Are you letting the word of God shape your actions? See, we have to commit to a life of growth, commit to a life of spiritual maturity that says, no, no, I'm going to go deeper in my faith this year. I'm going to be better equipped to navigate life's challenges this year. I, I, I'm gonna, I want to be able to pour into others the, the wisdom that God has poured into me. We need spiritually mature believers. See, here's how you know you're spiritually immature. Can I help you this morning? This might hurt a little bit. But here's how you know you're spiritually immature. You only drink milk. You only drink milk. You're like, pastor, what are you talking about? I only drink milk. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know who drinks milk, right? Babies drink milk, right? And the, how, do, how do babies get their milk? They're either bottle fed or they're breastfed, right? See, so many Christians, you show up to church and you're being nurtured through a bottle. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like, do you have a bottle? Can I borrow that bottle? Is that cool? There's a bottle. There's, there's a bottle, right? This bottle is like the word of God. And you know who drinks this is babies. And it's appropriate for a baby to drink milk. Would you agree? Like if a baby was drinking milk, there would be nothing wrong with that. Like, oh, how cute. Can I, can I, can I borrow? Can, can I borrow my nephew? This is little Cohen making his debut. What's up, buddy? So, how cute? Everyone, what did you just say? Aww. <laughs> so cute. But he, super cute, right? There's nothing wrong with it. All right, I'm going to take it. Now, now, sermons are milk, right? Because I, me, I studied all week. Here, hold on. Come here, big boy. I studied all week to preach this message, right? I downloaded the nutrients necessary to preach this message. I got into the word of God and prayed for God to give me this word. I spent time with God. And now he's, he's given me the nutrients, kind of like he gives the mom nutrients. Right? What does the mom do? She eats. She eats healthy. Right? She feeds her body right. And then what does she do? She nurses her baby. And it's appropriate. Right? Because he can't feed himself yet. He's just a baby. And so it's okay to be a baby and drink milk. It's okay to be a spiritually immature Christian if you're new to Christianity. Would you agree? All right, let me give you him back before I... Now, where's his dad? His dad's, in, can I keep this bottle? Come here, dad. Where's his dad at? Now, it was very, very cute when I fed the baby. But see, it's not so, it's, you know, it's not so cute when I feed his dad, right? It's a little weird. Would you agree? Like if I put Todd on my hip and started feeding him, 
it's a little weird. See, sometimes that's how Christian men look if you've been coming for the church a long time and I'm still the one that has to nurse you because you cannot feed yourself. See, sometimes you got to go home and you got to open up the word for yourself. You got to pray for yourself. You got to, you got to, you got to begin to eat meat. See, that's how you know you're spiritually immature is when I'm the only one that's feeding you. When the pastor is the only one that feeds you, I want you to have that image burn into your mind, me feeding Todd a Bible or a bottle. If the only time you get into the word is when I open it up for you, guess what? I'm like your nursing mother. And that's sketchy and it's weird. But if you're a baby, it's appropriate. If you're new to this, if you're new to church, if you're new to Jesus, if you're, if you're spiritually a baby, that's okay. It's not weird. Let me nurture you. Let me pastor you. Let me take care of you. Let, let me get it downloaded into me so I can give to you so I can, so I can take care of you and, and grow you up. But if you've been here for a while and you're still only eating what I give you, it's a little weird. Too far? I told you this might hurt a little bit, but we got a lot of grown Christians still nursing. So what do the apostles do? They continued steadfast daily in the apostles' doctrine. They didn't just depend on Peter. They got into the word themselves. They began to understand. So what you do, so, so here's very practical. Take the scriptures that I give you, right? Because I've, God gives them to me, at least I feel like he does, to give to you. And then you go home and you study and go, God, what does this mean for my life? God, how can I apply this to my life? God, that's called being spiritually mature. Here's the second way you know you're spiritually immature. Whoa, this one might hurt too. You're easily persuaded. Like, you know you're spiritually immature when you're just easily persuaded. The Bible says Ephesians chapter four, then we will no longer be immature like children, we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever uh, they sound like truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. See, when you're spiritually immature, man, you're easily persuaded. You're easily moved. But when you're mature in the Lord, no one is going to convince you no matter how strong the argument is that God isn't good. No one is going to convince you or persuade you that there's another way. No one is going to make a good enough argument with you that's going to have you lose your faith. It doesn't matter what situation, what trial, what circumstance I go through. I'm not doubting. I'm not giving up. My faith is rooted in its planet on the rock of Jesus Christ. But if you're spiritually immature, you just follow every TikTok preacher that says something that you agree with, right? But spiritually immature believers, man, they, they run in the face of conflict. They run in the face of adversity. They compromise their values when they get around a different group of friends. That hit somebody. Good. <laughs> they switch up. They're just spiritually immature. So this is not a call of condemnation, this is a call of, hey, let's grow up so we can continue the momentum so God can continue to use us and we can change and transform people's lives, kind of like they did. If you're offended, you might just be. You said it, not me. <laughs> they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. Number two, I'm going to go quick. Number two, they were people of prayer. They were people of prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. See, if we want to grow spiritually, then we must be people of prayer. Mariah touched on this last week if you were here, but there's this big lie. It's the biggest lie in America, and it said every Sunday morning at 9 and 11 o'clock all across the country, and it's, I'll pray for you. It's the biggest lie Christians say, I'll pray for you, brother pray for you, sister. It's kind of like the terms and conditions. You know, you just scroll down, click it. It's like, yes, I read the terms and conditions. Like, no, you didn't. 
You didn't pray for them. But we got to be people of prayer. Every big move of God started in prayer. The Azusa Street revivals, it was all about prayer. The Jesus movement started in prayer. The Welsh revival started in prayer. We got to be people of prayer. And not just me praying for you or your connect group leaders praying for you. No, no, you pray for you. You pray for your church. You pray for the city. You pray for your family. You pray for our government. Why? Because God hears your prayers. He hears your prayers. Paul and Silas, uh, Philippians 1.9, 119. For I know, this is what they were praying in the jail. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers. See, Paul sent a letter to the church in Philippi. He's like, listen, I know this is going to turn out for my deliverance through your prayers. Paul knew he had a praying church. Paul knew that he had people that were praying for him. Are you praying for people who are locked up spiritually? Are you praying for people who are locked up physically? Are you praying for your neighbors and praying for your friends and praying for your family that you can be so confident and go, I know that this is going to turn out for my deliverance through your prayers. We got to be people of prayer. Prayer is a way for us to communicate with God. It's a way to share our hopes and concerns and our desires. Man, we got to seek him. We got to seek his guidance. We got to seek his peace. This is crazy that the architect of the universe, the creator of the galaxies wants to speak to you. Like, like you have to believe this. Prayer is powerful. No one has power with God who doesn't pray. That's going to hit you a little bit later. And it doesn't matter if you've been saved for 50 years, for 50 months, for 50 days, or for 50 minutes. God wants to speak to you. Jesus didn't just teach about prayer. Jesus didn't just sing about prayer. Jesus lived a life of prayer. If anyone didn't need to pray, it was Jesus. Would you agree? But what did he do? He separated himself and went and spent time with the Father, trying to get his will aligned with the Father's will, right? Peter, James, John, you guys stay here. Keep a lookout for me. I need to go and pray. I need to go get my will, my thoughts, my mind, my heart, my desires aligned with the Father. If anyone didn't need to pray, it was him. He was never so much in a rush that he didn't pray. And sometimes, if we're being honest, we're in such a rush that we forget to pray. You ever been there? I got to get to church. We'll do it in the name of Jesus and not even pray. Right? Like, we're just so busy that we'll lay our head down at night and not even think about God all day. We're in such a rush. It's kind of like I shared this at our men's prayer the other, the other morning. You guys remember the, the movie Home Alone? Come on, you remember the morning where they're leaving on their trip? The mom, this is probably like, this is Mariah every Sunday morning. Grab your stuff, it's time to go, right? Get in the car. Where they're grabbing their suitcases and they're grabbing all their stuff and they're rounding up all the kids and they, they finally get in the car and they pack everyone in. They drive to the airport because they're late. They get to the airport. They're running through the airport and then they check in. They finally sit down and then what do they do? Where's Kevin. They got so busy, they forgot their son. Have you gotten so busy that you've forgotten the son? <laughs> that you're just trying to get through life, grabbing everything you have. Where's Jesus? Oh, yeah, you forgot him. He was trying to spend time with you this morning, but you just, you just left him sitting there on your shelf. We got to be people of prayer if we want to keep this momentum going. Number three, number three, they practice people proximity. They practice people proximity. Verse 44, now all who believed were together, had all things in common. They were, they were together. They were together. They had all things in common. This is, why, this is why connect groups are so important. This is why two-minute turn up is so important. We're trying to connect you. It's not just because we need like, hey, how could we add two minutes to the service? No, no, we're trying to connect you. It's so important that you get around the right people. See, the reason that early church was growing so fast is because they didn't, just, they didn't just stick to the people that were closest to them either. 
They didn't just have their little groups. Like it wasn't just like, oh, these, no, no, no. They went out and they reached people that weren't like them. Like some of you, every two minute turn up, you say hi to the same three people. I'm preaching good this morning. <laughs> like they went out and, and, and reached people that didn't look like them, the Jews and the Gentile, right? They, they went out and, and see, sometimes what I've learned is it's hard to, to know the needs of the people around you if you don't ever live amongst them. Like it's easy to have an opinion about a, a group of people, but if you've never been around them or understand their story or what they've been through, then how could you help them if you don't even know them? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, you got to get around people. Do you, do you know the needs of the people in your life? Because we can never be a solution of our city if we've not yet experienced the problems that people are facing in our city. We got we to gotta practice people proximity. We got to get around some other people. It's easy to hang out with people you like. It's hard to get around people you don't like or look different or think different or act different or vote different. You got to get around other people. See, this is just a little bit of my testimony. Um, prior to becoming a youth pastor for six years, I hated teenagers because I was one. And I'm like, I don't, I, I don't want to spend time with them. No, sounds terrible. Miserable, actually. They're weird. They're awkward. They got problems that aren't really problems. They just think they're problems. Right? Come on, you got teenagers. You know what I'm talking about. It's like, <laughs> but, but I was asked to be a youth pastor, and I was like, sure, I'll do it. And see, as I begin to get involved in their lives, and as I begin to invest time with them and pray with them and spend my own money on them, until I began to do life with them, until I had to talk some of them off of pulling the trigger over the phone after I had to show up numerous times in the middle of the night to sit by their bedside while their stomach was being pumped from the drug. See, until you actually invest in the people that may not look, think, act, or be like you, until you actually can invest some time with them, you'll never love them like Jesus loved them. See, Jesus didn't just hang out with the sinners and the outcasts because like, it was the cool thing to do. No, no, no. He was trying to get on their level so he can bring them up to his. See, we got to practice people proximity. We got to reach out to people that may not look, think, or act like us and go, man, I got some stuff for them. I, I know this guy, his name's Jesus. I, he, can, he can save your life. He can change your whole world. He can shift your eternity. But you, they'll never hear you if you're only preaching from up here. If you're only preaching down, they'll be like, forget you, bro. I ain't trying to hear all that. So we got to practice people proximity. Number four, they lived generously. They lived generously. They were some generous people. Acts 2, 44. Now all who believe were together and all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. See, I'm just believing that the people of God, Christians, man, we got to move into a place of financial freedom. We, we got to move into a place where we ain't so broke no more. Like, I'm just believing that for the church. I'm believing that for your family, that, man, we got to be, if we're God's children, then, man, I want to be overflowing, not just for me, but so we can give back. I want to be so blessed that we can be a blessing, that the years of debt and struggle and month to month and paycheck to paycheck are over. Like, we got to be people that just, we, we're so blessed to be a blessing. It's, it's time for the church to, to thrive and live in the blessing of God. You see, these people were generous. One of our values at God's house is generosity is our privilege. Generosity is about giving more than what's required. We're, we're generous with our time, with our talent, with our treasure. We go first in our giving. God has given so richly towards us. It's an honor to give back to him. So you got to get your mind right about being generous. It's not wrong to have stuff. It's just wrong when the stuff has you. I like stuff. I like stuff. You like stuff? I like stuff. There's nothing wrong with stuff. It's just wrong when the stuff has you, when you can't give it away, when that stuff is your God, when that money is your God. 
1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See, the love of money turns into idolatry. You begin to idolize money. You begin to live your whole life based around money. The truth is money is just a tool, right? A tool to do what God wants you to do. Uh, There's a difference. So you you hear this in the world. Oh, money is just a tool. Yeah, it's a tool to do what God wants you to do. Not what you want to do. Money is a tool to do what God wants you to do. Someone say amen. amen. Giving is not just about you. It's about benefiting the people around you. Who rules your money? Do do you rule your money or does God rule your money? Because when I rule my money, I know me. I'm selfish. I'm greedy. I want stuff for me and my family. But when God rules my money, it is no longer about me. Now it's about other people, right? What does the book of Isaiah say? Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What government rules your money? Because if your money is under the government of Brandemir or the government of you, then you know what that leads to, lack, greed, selfishness. But when it's under the government of God, what does it lead to? Wonderful, everlasting, peace, counsel. Isn't that what it says? Unto us a son is born, and the government will be upon his shoulders. I'm trying to put my money under the government of God. Amen? And number five, lastly, you can come join me. Is this helping anybody? All right. Number five, the early church, they were planted not potted. They were planted. They were not potted. It says this, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, in the temple. See, when you're planted in the temple, when you're planted in the church, when you're planted in a body, what does that mean? That means you're growing roots. You're not going anywhere. You can't be shaken. You're, you're planted. Like it's, it's, it's down there. Every single week, the roots are growing deeper, wider, and stronger. You're planted. You don't move. A tree that's planted, it doesn't matter if it's windy outside. It doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter what's going on. Over time, that tree becomes so strong because the root system is so deep that it does not move. See, when you're planted in the house of God, it does not matter if you get offended. It does not matter if there's drama. It does not matter if you don't like someone. It does not matter. You're not shaken. You're planted. As long as the Bible is being preached and the word of God is going forth, God has placed you in a temple, in a church, in a community for a reason. Plant yourself down. Why? Because those who are planted in the house of God, their lives will flourish. But the truth is, most Christians aren't planted. They're potted. And so this is what most Christian Sunday morning looks like. Hey, let's check out this place. Woo, that's great. Worship was fire. Preaching, not so good. Let's try this church. And they shake themselves out of the pot. Because, I mean, you know, if there's a plant in a pot, you can kind of shake it out and move it. So they, ah, oh, we like the worship, not the preaching. Ooh, let's try this one. Oh, this one's. And then they, they get in this pot. They're like, ah, oh, preaching fire, worship, not so much. Ah, oh, I don't like it. They shake themselves out of this one. They're like, oh, okay, let's go to, um, well, let's go this should I, mm, let me really offend you. Um, no, I won't do it. No, I won't do it. But, but they just, they just, it might be too real for some of you. Um, but they just move themselves around from Hook Boulevard to I Avenue to Nisqually to Main Street to online to North Carolina 
to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you're not planted anywhere. So no wonder why your life is a mess because you don't have a pastor. No wonder why your life is a mess because you don't have a community because everything offends you. There's always something. You don't like something. Someone said something. This happened somewhere. But see, the reason they were able to keep so much momentum going is because they were planted. None of us are perfect. I know you're thinking I probably referenced certain places, and I did, but guess what? I also met with every single one of those pastors. I know them. I hang out with them. I go to lunch with them. I meet with them. And we're all on the same page. So guess what? When you leave here, they call me. Hey, you know this couple? Yeah, I know them. Amazing. Love on them. Bless them. Guess what? They do, I do the same for them. It doesn't matter if you, if this is not like the one and only, this is not my kingdom. <laughs> like we're, there's a, there's a big C, capital C church, the church of Jesus Christ. That's what we're all trying to build. But all I'm trying to tell you is just get planted somewhere. It don't have to be here. Get planted somewhere and stop moving around. Not for our benefit. I'm good. For your benefit. So your life will flourish. So your life will prosper. Some of you are so convicted right now. You're like, shoot, that's me. That's okay. I love you. I promise you. I'm trying to help you. Man, we got to be people who mature spiritually, people of prayer. We got to practice people proximity. We got to live generously and we got to be planted and not potted. Amen. Let's become spiritually mature. Let's be people of prayer. Let's live close to people. Let's give back to people. Let's stay in the house of God. I want to keep the momentum going. We need to keep the momentum going. We're on an assignment from God to reach people. God has chosen us for such a time as this. We are in the right place at the right time, on the right corner, in the right desert to reach the people that God has called us to reach. Let's keep the momentum going. God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word today. Thank you for the deposit that you've made in us today. God, let us be like the church in Acts chapter 2 where you add it to them every single day. God, let us grow spiritually mature. God, that's the desire of our heart, that we would know you more, that we would love people more, that we would love our neighbor as we love ourselves, that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, that's your will for us, God. That's what we want to do. We want to just be on assignment for you. And so God, use this church, use these people, use this congregation to reach people who are lost, who are broken, who are hurt, There's so many people that we know, God, who are going through a hard time, going through a struggle, going through a difficult season in their life. And they're just looking for a people, for a church who would just love them, who would just accept them, who would just take them in and didn't judge them, God. And who would nurture them over time. They would grow up and be strong and be able to live out the life that you've called them to live. God, let us be that church that nurtures the lost, that sees the broken, that heals the sick through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, those people in here right now who say, man, this is my home. God's house is my house. I'm not going anywhere. God, would you just have a holy conviction of spiritual maturity on their life? That we need more leaders. We need more pastors. We need more group leaders and ministry leaders. This is not about me, Lord. This is about you. We all want to serve you, bless you, and honor you, give you glory. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen.